Um, as I already mentioned, I want to talk about EPPF, XTP, what it is, and um, what are some recent developments in Linux kernel community. Um, to start off, what is PPF? Probably everybody of you has used TCP dump in one way or another. If you enter some filter in TCP dump, that filter gets compiled down into a, some bytecode. This bytecode is called PPF. This is done by the PCAP and then pushed into the kernel in AF packet. Um, and that is already existent for a very long time. And um, nowadays we call this classic BPF or CBPF, and this got extended heavily, um, probably like one or two years ago in the kernel, into something that is called eBPF. And eBPF is an efficient um, generic uh, in-kernel bytecode engine. Um, it is used in many different subsystems in the kernel right now. There are probably like three diff uh, three major areas which is networking, tracing, and also uh, sandboxing or security. Um, regarding tracing and uh, sandboxing, so tracing, for example, uh, you have like perf where you can um, attach BPF programs to um, trace points, k probes, <coughs> things like that, and then every time an event triggers, an EPPF program runs, and then you can analyze um, different things in the kernel. You can read kernel memory and so on and so forth. For sandboxing, probably the uh, most popular or most prominent user is uh, the Chrome web browser, where it uses uh, seccom BPF to uh, filter on um, system calls to, to whitelist uh, system calls and so on. So this is quite flexible. Um, that seccom BPF um, is not eBPF. Uh, yet, it's uh, CBPF, so still this classic BPF that is pushed down into the kernel. Um, and networking, which is what we want to talk about here, um, there are various things, for example, in sockets, you have socket filters with AF packet. Uh, what I already mentioned, then you have various DMAX facilities, for example, SO reuse port, when you have multiple sockets that are in a group that can reuse um, uh, a specific port, then you can have an eBPF program that makes a decision to what port uh, that connection is going to be. Um, you also have for AF packet, for example, fan out, uh, where you have multiple AF packet sockets, and then um, the traffic can get load balanced like that to one of those sockets participating in that group. And um, then you have XTP and TC. So um, I will start with uh, the uh, facility that we have in TC. This is called CLS PPF or PPF classifier. It's called like this, I mean, classifier for historical reasons, but it can do way more than just classification. So it's, uh, it's a flexible, programmable um, packet processor in the TC subsystem. You can attach that. You can uh, an, an, uh, attach an eBPF program there on the ingress or egress path of the kernel data path um, of an networking device, and yeah, and then and then we also have XTP, which got recently introduced into the kernel. This is also programmable, but high performance um, in kernel packet processor. Um, um, that is attachable to um, drivers that support it and on the ingress side of the driver. I will talk a bit more about that later. Um, I think both things, they are complementary to each other in the sense that CLS BPF can be attached to all networking devices, also virtual ones like Weave devices um, for uh, different networking namespaces, and it can be attached on ingress and egress, and XTP is uh, currently on ingress. And for CLS PPF, you have a socket buffer, which is the networking representation, uh, uh, the kernel representation of a network packet. Uh, as you have that as an input into the PPF program, where it works with that data, and um, you have a bit more richer context um, with that. But both are complementary to each other and uh, quite flexible. So first, before I dive into the details of both subsystems, um, I want to present uh, shortly about the EPPF architecture. Uh, it consists of um, 11 64-bit registers. You also have 32-bit sub-registers there. You have a stack that is limited. It's currently 512 bytes on the uh, kernel stack. Implicitly program counter, of course, 
the instructions, they are fixed size, 64-bit 64, 64 wide, and you can have maximum of 4,069 instructions per program, which doesn't seem much, but you can, do, you can still do uh, quite a lot and quite also complex things with it. Um, Compared to the CPPF that we know from TCP dump, like what I mentioned earlier, um, there are various new instructions. Of course, you have the whole 64-bit range of instructions for ALU operations, for example, because the CPPF was only on 32-bit, and you have things like um, a, um, a call, uh, you have a call in, in instructions where you can call um, into a helper function, what I call, what I will explain that later. Um, so there's various new in, in instructions. Um, some of the core components of the architecture is that you have uh, read-write access to the uh, input context. Uh, the input context, as I mentioned, for example, in TC is a socket buffer. In um, XTP, it's like um, a, a small representation where you can access the uh, DM, uh, like the, the network packet for the uh, XTP representation. Then you have a helper function concept, which means that the kernel um, exposes a fixed defined set of helpers or like functions that the BPF program can call into. So it cannot call arbitrary kernel memory, um, but just a fixed set. Um, then uh, there are maps. Maps are efficient uh, key value uh, data structures that can be uh, shared arbitrarily, which means uh, one or multiple EPPF programs can access that map or um, user space can, can access and read or update data from it uh, at the same time. So then there are tail calls. Tail calls the concept uh, where, BPF, where one BPF program can call another BPF program. So you don't, all, you, you don't have this fixed limitation of 4,069 instructions per program, but you can also go beyond that. And um, this is quite useful. It, it, it reuses the same stack frame, so it's also quite fast. Um, then there's a the concept of object pinning, which means that from the user space perspective, programs and maps, they're accessed through file descriptors. And once you load your EPPF program into the kernel, for example, via TC, um, then this uh, file descriptor, con or this, your file descriptor is basically unavailable for other programs to use. And um, uh, to, to share maps uh, with also other applications, uh, you, can, you can pin them in a pseudo file system um, as a node there, and then those other programs, they can re retrieve it and also work on this map to update or read data. Then in the kernel, uh, there's a CBPF to EBPF translator, which means that uh, whenever you load your classic uh, TCP dump filter in the kernel that gets transparently uh, translated to EPPF and only runs on EPPF. And the nice thing about EPPF is that from user space side, LVM has an EPPF backend, which means that uh, you can write a C-like uh, program and LVM translates that into an object file which has EPPF instructions that can then be loaded into the kernel. And last but not least, there's not only an EPPF interpreter in the kernel, but also a just-in-time compiler. So whenever you load a program and the just-in-time compiler is enabled, then this gets mapped directly to native opcode. So you can run with native performance. All of that is managed through the uh, BPF system call. So it's like a stable API, and also your programs, when, they, when you implement them, they are basically stable, so once your kernel supports that, um, it's like a guarantee that newer kernels will also support that in the future, unlike, for example, kernel module where internals can always change. So um, to give you some more details regarding TC, um, TC, you can basically attach this CLS BPF uh, to uh, QDisk, and there's like a QDisk which is called um, chat CLS Act, which is just a pseudo QDisk similar to the Ingress QDisk in the kernel. And this is only there for the purpose of attaching um, classifiers and actions, uh, if you're familiar with uh, TC. Um, 
And in that case, what we want to attach is, of course, uh, serial SPPF. Uh, there, there are like two central hooks where this shared CLS act QDIS can attach to, which is the ingress and the egress hook. So they are basically like really central places where every packet has to go to uh, from RX and TX side. Um, yeah, so your SPPF, it runs eBPF. Historically, it also supports uh, CBPF, so both flavors. And you can atomically update your programs during runtime, which is really uh, useful. Um, Either, of, either the uh, root program that is attached to the CLS BPF classifier itself or those tail calls uh, where one program calls into another that can also atomically get updated during runtime without, without restarting uh, your networking interface, things like that. And um, CLS BPF has a fast path, which means that uh, historically TC has classifiers and actions that I mentioned, and uh, classifier, once it's done classifying, can then call into a chain of actions, and all of that is pretty inefficient. And EBPF can do everything contained in itself anyway, so therefore uh, this CLS BPF has a so-called direct action mode where um, EBPF can classify a mango, per perform various actions on the uh, SKB, on the socket buffer that is as an input, and then just return a verdict and then be done with it. So it doesn't call into a chain of actions or whatever. Um, everything is done in the EBPF program itself. And there's also an offload interface available. For example, the Netronome NFP driver, uh, if you have such a Netronome smart NIC, uh, uh, can offload eBPF programs, which means that whenever you, you load your program to CLS PPF and have such a card, then it gets translated into, the, in, in, into a native code that um, is supported for the instruction set on the NFP driver. So a typical workflow would be you write your C program, you compile it with LVM, it gets translated into up into ELF instructions, uh, sorry, into eBPF instructions. They are contained in an ELF in an object file. TC in that, in that case can read that object file and load those instructions to the kernel. In the kernel they get verified, which means that the verifier makes sure that uh, the instructions cannot crash the kernel, it cannot create infinite loops, things like that. Then it gets just in time compiled. Then um, this is pushed down into a CLS BPF uh, classifier, and then eventually uh, gets offloaded. So that's like typical workflow for that. And XTP, on the other hand, um, this was introduced probably one year ago into the kernel. Um, the objectives there is that it's really uh, tailored for uh, high performance packet processing. Um, so it, what it does is it runs an eBPF program at the very earliest point uh, in the driver. So this is earlier, so, so even be, be, be before you allocated a, uh, an, an SKP metadata structure, this is, this is also one of the um, um, overheads the kernel uh, have for doing high performance packet processing with small packets in particular. And the nice thing is that this kind of framework uh, works in concert with the kernel, which means it, it uses the same security model. model. You don't have your uh, NIC representation or your, your driver in user space and, and have it um, ex ex exposed uh, there, but it still stays in the kernel. Um, there's no out of tree module needed for accessing that. And the packet itself, it also stays in the kernel, which means you don't have to cross boundaries when you want to get it out or when you want to push it back into the kernel, which is, for example, nice if you want to work with containers. Um, for example, one of the use cases could be uh, that you're implementing a, a firewalling application and there you can already filter packets out at the very earliest possible point on your NIC, and then from there, uh, part of those packets that can uh, get further passed to the kernel stack and then into some of the containers. Um, other use cases include uh, load balancing. For example, direct server return load balancing is currently possible with that. And any mangling and forwarding or anti 
denial of service uh, measures. Monitoring is also possible, so there's currently a, an interface where you can push packets to user space for sampling and monitoring from XDP side. Um, yeah, and you have various verdicts similar to TC, which means either you have, um, can drop packets, pass them further onto the kernel stack, or transmit them out again. And there, there are currently a number of drivers that support that. Um, uh, some, uh, for example, Mellanox drivers, MLX4 and MLX5. Then we have the Netronome driver again, and uh, QLogic. There, uh, there's recently Red Eye on Net uh, support that has been merged. And Intel i4DE uh, is, was posted to the NetDev list, so um, it will be merged uh, soon, and as well uh, BNXT. Um, the uh, drivers, or at least some of them, currently depending on the implementation, but that will change in the future, that all of them will support that, um, most likely, um, allow also for atomic updates. So once you have your uh, XTP program loaded and you want to update it with, with, it with a new version, um, this can happen without uh, this, this disruption of any traffic. And also XTP has an uh, offloading interface, and again, also a Netronome um, has support for that. So once you load your XTP program, um, Netronome um, can offload that with a couple of limitations currently. Um, but it's already a good way forward. Uh, and the workflow here, similar to what I mentioned earlier, you have your C program, you have LVM, and this time IP, so I IP link command can be used as a loader. Um, for pushing the, um, uh, the, the BPF sequence down to the kernel. And yeah. Some of those features, um, I mentioned there are maps which are efficient key value stores. Um, you can, from a BPF program, look up update or delete elements. Uh, currently, there are a couple of flavors which are array maps, hash tables, uh, least recently used maps, and longest prefix match which has been merged um, not too long ago. They are all available for both uh, types. And for the array hash and LRU, you also have uh, per CPU variants. Um, and there's also a possibility to pre-allocate the whole memory, so you have a pool, um, and you can um, you don't have to allocate your elements through the normal uh, kernel al uh, allocation facilities. Then there are also specialized maps, which means they cannot be used like those generic maps, but they are rather used with uh, PPF helpers. Um, for example, the uh, program array uh, map, which is uh, used for tail calls, where you can um, push file descriptors into this uh, uh, specific map, and then um, uh, you can jump into that through that. Um, there's uh, direct packet access, which means, um, and, and, and it is supported in, in both cases, CLS, PPF, and XDP. Direct packet uh, read and write means that in the past, CLS, PPF had to use helper functions where you pass in a stack buffer and then it gets filled for, with, with the offset, the number of bytes you want to read. But direct packet read and write means you can, for example, just cast your header um, uh, directly without having to go through helper. So it's a performance optimization there. Um, you have a couple of additional metadata. For example, in the socket buffer case on CLS BPF, you can use uh, SKB mark, for example. As th th there are various other uh, things there, but um, so it can work with other facilities from the kernel as well. Um, regarding packet forwarding, so uh, CLS BPF, as I mentioned, it can uh, forward uh, so it can forward packets um, to any networking device, including virtual ones. So when you push that into container over Reef, for example, um, you can push it out to the same port, or it can loop it back to the Oryx path. Uh, for XDP, it's currently uh, still limited. So in the XDP case, you can only push it out to the same port it came in. Um, but there's work in progress to also support multi-port. Um, uh, TX or 
um, TX through a, a different net device that also supports XDB. That will come in the future, but currently to the same part, it's still useful because, for example, when you have the load balancing use case with direct server return, your um, node that runs or your load balancer that would run so XDP gets the packet uh, in and rewrites various parts and push it out again, but the reply packets, since it's direct server return, go a different path, so it's still uh, very useful to do that. Um, then some miscellaneous things, you can do encapsulation, so there's uh, VXLAN, Geneve, GRE, IPIP encapsulation available for CLS BPF in XDP, you're way more flexible actually. You can do any kind of encapsulation you want because at that point, at that early point in time, the kernel doesn't know anything about the packet that is coming in yet. And um, so you're not limited by the current um, 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 internal details from the uh, socket buffer itself. Uh, then there's also event notification, which is a really useful feature. Um, what it does, you can have custom your own custom structs in, in, uh, in the eBPF program and then push that to a high performance per CPU memory mapped uh, ring buffer to user space. Um, that can be um, some specific metadata or data and packet and, and, and the packet data it, it, it itself up to the full packet. Um, uh, so that is useful if you have some management demons that then listen on, on, on certain uh, e e events and update later on map data or programs for telecalls and so on. You have checks on mangling, uh, you have C-group support and various other things. Uh, IPv2 as a loader, I, I already mentioned it, that it has, um, uh, it can uh, push down the EPPF uh, bytecode into the kernel. Um, just to give you an, an, an example how it looks, so for example in TC case you set up the QDisk first, then you can set up the filter and then you here you define whether an ingress or egress site uh, you want to uh, hook that uh, BPF program to and then you define the object itself and then the object can have uh, various sections which contain the program code, the actual program code. And an XDP workflow, uh, it's currently where you can say, uh, I want to uh, load the program via IP link, and then um, as well specify the object, and then it gets pushed down. Um, they have a common shared uh, library as, an, as the loader backend. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be IP route 2. You can also have other loaders if you program them your, yourself or other libraries that support it. So it's just one flavor uh, where you can do that. Then regarding just-in-time compilers, um, there's x86 uh, support, ARM64, PowerPC, and S390X, uh, so they all have eBPF offloads. Um, uh, yeah, um, PowerPC got recently merged, which is nice, and um, the same for the NFP driver, which also implements a just-in-time compiler for the NFP-specific instruction set for the networking offload. There are various uh, measures against uh, for uh, hardening uh, those uh, triggered programs. I'm not going too much into detail here. Uh, and there are other recent improvements. For example, LVM, LVM's EPPF backend recently got 12 support, which means um, you can annotate your uh, code with the actual, um, your generated object code with the actual source uh, code that you have, and for it's definitely an improvement for the for the bugging. Um, there are various verifier improvements that can recognize the LVM generated code a little bit better in the kernel, so it accepts those programs as well. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and trace points have recently been merged, and um, so on. So a couple of next steps, so definitely uh, there still have to be Im improvements from the verification side in terms of logging or provide um, more uh, uh, or, uh, helpful user messages, for example, then in terms of search pruning so that the verifier can um, more uh, um, aggressively um, uh, so that the verifier doesn't have to do, do too much work to verify each possible path of the program. And then there has to be better XDP driver support uh, in, in future, but that will come over time. Um, and um, 
yeah, so those are exam some, some examples of next steps regarding code. Uh, if you want to look at some code and, and how uh, the BPF parts are written there, I can recommend you to go to github.com slash Cilium, which is a project which um, implements basically BPF and XDP for containers. There will be a talk afterwards for that and everything else on the kernel and IP row 2 side is merged upstream. And um, for further information, you can also look at the uh, NetDev conference papers uh, that, that are there, or the kernel documentation, and so on. Are there any questions? All right. There's a, a, an asymmetry there between the features supported between uh, CLS and um, XDP. Right. Do you expect convergence over time, or do you, I know there are two different levels in the stack, but do you expect them to converge over time? Right. Um, I don't expect to converge all of that because, I mean, those are like two different layers of the stack. Um, and uh, for some situations or use cases, one thing might be better than, than, than the other. So it's, it's, it's not like it will be exactly the same or something, right? So uh, as I mentioned earlier, they are uh, complementary to each other. So uh, yeah. All right. Is it possible to modify packets in the XDP based on state? So like when I want to do different IP before and not or something like this? Right. Uh, so, so you definitely can, oh, okay, I should repeat the question. Is it possible to modify packets based on state, for example, for nothing and, uh, yeah. So it's definitely possible. So state you can hold basically in BPF maps. That's what they are there for. And you can modify, so as I mentioned, there's direct read, direct write possibilities. So, uh, yeah. Sylvian, for example, does that. Does it also look when it's offloaded to the hardware? Um, so uh, I'm currently not quite aware what features Netronome support, but I think they should be able to write as well. Ah, okay, but the, the one limitation for the Netronome hardware is that they do not yet support BPF maps, but that will come in future. So there's work in progress from Netronome side. I don't work for them, but just to tell you what I know. <laughs> okay. So one of the next step of XDB is to be able to forward to any port. What is the most difficult in this task? I think the most difficult task is um, the... Uh, <laughs> So uh, one of the challenges in XDP is that you forward this to a different port and what uh, is the most difficult task there, right? Um, is that you have, uh, that you need to have um, the, uh, well, um, so there's currently um, uh, work in regarding having a, a page pool allo uh, allocator. Uh, which means that if you want to forward that to a different NIC even, they have to have some common understanding on how to transfer the packet from this side to another, right? Without copying, for example. So you need to have like a common shared page pool um, construct that you can just transfer those pages to the other one so that they can uh, uh, TX that. Um, yeah, so this still, I think, uh, um, quite some work there to get that supported. Yeah. What, what's, what's about the, the locking logic? Because right now the execution has to be perpetual. The what? The locking logic? Yes. Is, is it uh, for maps? For sharing maps between? Ah, for for maps. Um, so. So what about the locking logic for maps? And uh, yeah, so for example, array maps, on, on array maps, uh, whether you have a per CPU or non -per not per CPU, you're basically on your own, which means that um, um, the, the program has to be written in a way that um, it, it doesn't have race conditions. So, so, so you have some, some instructions, for example, um, um, atomic add, where you can use to increment counters on, on that side. For the hash tables, uh, you have uh, basically the update helper call, which atomically replaces one hash table map uh, element with another. And um, so, yeah, so there are various, uh, it, it, it is dependent on, on, on the map, certainly. And, um, but there are various performance improvements to be done still. So.
All right. Um, if the, you can also grab me in the hallway if there are further questions. So uh, thank you very much.